we might actually take off so that we can get into interesting conversations. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Think Inside the Square. Um, I'm, my name is Celia Pavelov. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Australia Council for the Arts, and I'm your virtual ancestor today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I come from to you on today, um, the Eora Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the many nations that are not only our panellists are coming to us from, but also you as our, um, as our virtual audience. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge any First Nations peoples who are present with us today. Um, Think Inside the Square is our new little weekly online series for a period of a number of weeks or months, depending on how long we're in COVID land for. It's on Tuesday at 2 p.m. And it's for the arts and creative industries as, as a resource at this time, answering your questions, a very safe space to talk about getting your practice online, any of the queries around hardware, technology, best practice, legality, any of those things. So the content is designed by you, the group, each week. So after this session, we wait for your questions to come through. We look at the most asked subject area, and then we quickly whip together a panel that we think you are going to be able to answer and support your questions as we go along. So following um, the live streaming session from last week, which was all about live streaming, we had Elliot, Tara, Mark and David. You requested this week a session um, around the virtual experience. So we're again joined by another fantastic panel that have been very generous with their time, particularly before and after Easter, agreeing to come on deck with us. So I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. But during the session, you can ask, feel free to ask any questions. So you can do that by the little Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen or the little chat um, conversation bubble that's also on your screen. We'll do our best to answer the questions as we're, um, as we go through the session today. But if there are any questions that we don't get to, we'll come back and either link you up to a panelist or try to answer them at a later date. Um, there's also closed captions on the bottom of the screen. We're joined with our partners, Red Bee, who've provided them for you. So you can turn them on if you, if you need them. Um, and other than that, I think I might actually just get straight into it. So our first panelist today is Frank Newman. So Frank comes to us from the Sydney Opera House. He's the creative learning specialist. Frank has an arts practice background and has worked as a director and producer. Frank will outline his work in outreach programs in schools. He's currently working on transitioning participatory arts practices to live online experience. So completely in the space that we want to be talking about today. Um, Frank will lead us through a series of guiding principles that he's developed to help design these processes and emerging projects that he'll chat through. Over to you, Frank. Thank you, Celia. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's very strange, I can't see anybody. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, flick to a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna share my screen with you all and then sort of uh, talk about bits and pieces. And then hopefully we'll have some time to go through some of the specifics um, that, um, yeah, I'm gonna hopefully open up some interesting conversations. Um, so brilliant start, not on the openings, not only, here we go, sorry, people. Um, so, Creative Leadership in Learning is a program that the Sydney Opera House runs in schools. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a bespoke program which we do with um, schools. The schools sign up for a three-year relationship with us. So, this, um, what I'm going to talk about is, is the kind of work we do inside that program. It's quite different to the sort of work the Opera House is doing in the program from our house to yours, which is, a, which is basically repackaging sort of past shows and kind of putting teachers' resources online. And if you kind of go to the website, the Opera House website, you'll see that. And that's being led by the amazing Stuart Buchanan and his team. So, um, but this is quite different. The work I'm going to talk about is really the nuts and bolts of what happens inside a kind of workshop, I guess, like how to take the kind of... Um, for those artists that kind of do run workshops and do socially inclusive work or participatory based arts work or teaching artistry or arts education, whatever you want to call it, it's people that use those kinds of process based um, approaches to kind of creating art with groups. Um, specifically in this context, the work we do is with schools. 
Um, so that's going to be, so yeah, bear that in mind as you go through and listen to this. This is working with primary and secondary um, schools, which is obviously very different to other groups. Um, so um, the Opera House has been doing this program for about sort of three years. Um, this is that we're in our fourth year. Creative leadership and learning is a three-year journey, as I was saying before, for each school. So we go on a kind of a really deep, meaningful engagement with them. The, the objective of the program is to, um, is to kind of really to move beyond a transactional relationship with schools to one which is based on creativity. Um, creative leadership and learning, which we know it as CLIL, has two streams of activity. So there's projects which are led by artists and they're sort of far reaching projects that cover the spectrum of the arts, there's dance, there's music, there's um, filmmaking, obviously a lot of theatre. And those projects last for about 20 weeks. And so complementing those projects are professional learning, which we do with the teachers. And so the idea is at the end of three years, schools are really well versed in using creativity in a classroom. And that's to, and, and how they point that creativity is up to them. We don't, it's not a plug and play program. So it's based around, um, I guess, the artistic practice, which would probably be best described as devising. So those people that use those, um, the sort of formats that have come through the theatrical traditions of, of of devising theatre, um, but we do work with people in visual art and film and um, people that have that sense of how to kind of hold a room and run a room. So there's approximately 20 to 25 artists that we engage across the year. This year there's 11 schools um, and um, each project with um, that an artist runs in each school is about 20 weeks long. So hopefully that gives you some context to what we do. Um, so we were at this position as we all were, so what, how do we, how do we, we wanted to transition this work to online very quickly so that we could basically save the contracts we had with the schools. We felt that we could honour the contracts and we felt no reason why we should not be as ambitious as we always had been in the non-digital world, in the digital space. So we wanted to kind of, we wanted to convince the schools that we could work with them and we wanted to convince ourselves. So to do that, we had to test everything that we wanted to try. And so we set ourselves a series of objectives of what we wanted to test. So, here they are. so um, and, and so um, this is all in Zoom. So we were working with Zoom because we could see that the Department of Education in New South Wales was moving towards Zoom. The Opera House was kind of working in Zoom. So we thought Zoom's the space we wanted to be in. Um, so in our test, we wanted to test group sizes because, you know, you, you can do things in large group sizes. You can do things on small group sizes. We wanted to test what worked in what size. We wanted to test um, the, um, the, the duration of workshops and we wanted to test what kind of games worked and what adaptations might sort of, what exercises could really function and why they did, um, what challenges were there and, and, and how complex could we be in the design of our workshop sequences. So how far could we go in 40 minutes or two hours or, um, and so to, to analyze all this, we came up with a care factor rating. So we kind of, we basically sat down and asked each other after trying the exercises, how, how, how much do we, did we enjoy that? You know, how much did we enjoy it? Did we actually give a crap about whether, you know, what, and, and why? Um, so, and based on that, we developed a, we, we, we did, we rated every exercise. Um, and I can go through specific exercises later on, um, but essentially, if it wasn't doing this to us, if it wasn't making us as excited and kind of and, and, and sort of switched on as, as, as this kind of analog um, project was, then why not and how could we get there? Um, so we came up with some essential preparations that need to happen for um, a good Zoom session. Um, so work with, the assumption was with students that, particularly with the younger students, that parents um, wouldn't be there. As much as the Department of Education says in some instances they have to be there, we, we assumed that parents would be busy doing things, running their lives, trying to save their own jobs, doing whatever they needed to be doing. So we came up with this assumption that um, the kids would have to, we'd have to help them set up their space, literally talking about the position of the laptop, the camera angle, how to work with the audio, um, and so that, and getting them to kind of stand up in the space and move around to kind of judge their space and could they be seen and heard basically. Um, then we went through some simple rules of Zoom. You've got to learn how to mute because if everyone's talking at the same time as kids lock them will do, um, it'll just be chaos and, um, and uh, being the host, having control of that yourself is the sort of artist running that space. You've got to know how to do that. 
Um, then muting people, stopping video um, and going through whether you're in speaker or gallery views and changing virtual backgrounds, which for, for some schools is really important because they don't want kids to be in a Zoom space without a virtual background on because there's no way of controlling what's in the background. There could be some dude watching porn in the back and the Department of Education says like, well, they have to have a virtual background. All those things are changing and being challenged. And so it, it's, it's interesting that space is it's changing as people are basically building the plane as they're flying it. Um, another essential thing is, is etiquette. Um, using thumbs up to say yes rather than everyone always talking um, uh, and, and defi defining those etiquette rules with the group as you would in any kind of workshop scenario, kind of getting people to kind of come up with the rules that they want to have running their space. And some people really go into that. Um, and the, the other thing we found that was really essential is to develop an understanding of the screen frame. So um, how to kind of play inside the frame, like, you know, what is the kind of, uh, you know, talking that you're using screen language, you know, was it up close, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of mid shots by far back, like really playing that and, get, and, and every, every single one of these essential preparation moments was an opportunity to make sort of art around it. So while it sounds quite dry, we're looking at ways to kind of make those art making moments. Um, but you had to go through that or otherwise other things just wouldn't work. Um, so following that, um, and using our care factor um, rating, rating system, we started to identify the things that we thought were working the best. And, and we decided, um, we came up with this kind of, this, this thing called the guiding principles. And this is by no means scientific, as you can tell by our care factor rating, um, but it's what it, was, it helped us design longer sequences and projects because remember we're moving towards 20 week projects it's not just a 40 minute workshop which ends it's like building something towards a major culminating work so these guiding principles um oh sorry there's particip participating artists it's important to reference those people who've been um key to making this work so um they're amazing artists who all do incredible work in um in, in a variety of settings um, um so here they are guiding principles um so it's really important that um, the, the nature of show um, and using this space to, um, to be showy <laughs> um, was, was, was really important. So having things, having timings, so going right, and you know, at sort of 11 o'clock, um, we'll sign on like we did now, but then having little curtains which could open and reveal us or having a piece of paper which we could rip and kind of, and sort of reveal something behind it. So playing with framing and playing with how much we could make it theatrical. How fun could we make that showing um, um, happen? And so the more we invested in that, the more fun we were having. So the more we cared, so the higher the rating went. Um, um, and, and that really can go as far as you want it. We, there was lots of conversations about how far you could push the show within this space. Um, smaller groups, um, uh, unsurprisingly obvious, work best. Um, smaller groups were, um, and shorter time frames um, were, and we're really we're successful, but we never, we haven't yet, and we want to do this, do a larger group where we do sort of like 40 people in a, in a piece of group choreography, like all on Zoom, all being able to see each other, all running from one side of the frame to the other, doing things fully choreographed or improvising, or um, we feel there's a space there, and we've got a choreographer on the team, Sarah Byam Vassala, who probably will play with that. So the more we tried exercises that were a little bit complex where you're flicking between one program, like we'd go from PowerPoint to, to Word, even things that we made the assumption that's like sort of kids in year, um, year five and year six would be able to do relatively easily, just didn't work because of people being on different operating systems. Some people on Apple, some people on, uh, on PC, some people on uh, you know, a, a phone. And so everyone had different processes to get to something, um, so the moment, so keeping things simple w was was the where the highest outcomes were. For example, literally just having the um, everyone. Um, we talked about posting materials to everybody in the class, um, and so you're controlling the palette of the material. But then everybody kind of being given simple instructions to make masks. And so the way that what that so that the the, the the structure of the workshop is designed designed and sort of held by us, but then everyone's basically just making, just crafting, making, being creative, and having the, some people had their camera looking at their hands working away. Some people had you know weren't even in the screen, or you could see some people kind of working in, in 
um, more directly to the camera. But everybody working away with music playing actually was really beautiful and wonderful um, because we were joined by the materials and joined by the music and joined by the time. Um, the, um, uh, the rhythm of the workshops is really important, making sure that there was a good rhythm to them. So there was, it went from sort of um, uh, so slower, kind of more um, meditative kind of um, uh, sort of exercises to things which are fast and snappy. And taking control as the facilitator of that rhythm was really important to keep the engagement high. Um, this next one, intrigue, is, um, is um, one we're kind of talking about, but the idea that you had to build intrigue in what um, would happen so that, so that kids were excited about what was to come. So there was lots of surprises or playing with, playing with um, um, working together. So you were wondering what your, your, your fellow, um, you know, player was going to do next. So all those things that would happen in improvisational um, settings in a room, um, you could just twist them to, to really dial up the intrigue. Um, and lastly, analog in the digital. So as much inclusion of analog materials, whether that's crafting materials, or there was an exercise where we had to flick water in our face if we got something wrong, super fun. And in fact, it was way more fun flicking water in our face than the kind of, um, than, than, than achieving um, than the exercise and kind of getting a reward. Um, so any inclusion of, of analog, and we pushed that conversation quite far. Um, how am I going, Celia? Am I just running out of, over time? Yeah, but if you could yeah. wrap up in the it would be great. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll leave it there. But just one, one, one quick last thing is we identified one of the things that we've been approached by one school is to look at designing a healing ceremony at the end of when all this is over. And, and I think that there's, a, there's for, people, for artists that work in this way, schools are a potential business case where you can actually work with schools to kind of do something around transitioning back to the non-COVID world. But I'm happy to talk about more of that later. Thank you very much. Sorry for going a bit over. No, 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 Frank, we've got two questions for you. So from yep. East Stafford, are the 11 schools private schools, primary and secondary, rural and remote? It's all public schools, all public schools in mostly um, southwestern and western Sydney. And from Elliot to Frank, how did you find using the larger sessions on Zoom and what kind? I know you sort of mentioned 40 or so attendees at, at one point in there. And have you explored rooms? Um, in that process at the same time? Um, so, as I was saying, that, that's something we're hoping to do is to, to do a big piece of Corrie with, um, with a larger group, but we haven't done that yet. Um, but um, I, I got a sense that that is possible um, by, being, by being in one larger kind of, um, but that's not untested. That's just a sense that that would work. It could be really fun. Um, so, yeah, Sarah Vine Vassallo will probably give that a go with her group. Um, and we have um, tried little breakout rooms, but not a lot of that. But that's something which certainly it seemed like it was potential to set people off on tasks. Um, with kids, little kids, they need to be sort of, you need to be sort of, you know, there helping them along. So with probably high school students, that's going to be more applicable, I would say. Thanks, Frank. I think so transferable, and especially those guiding principles, because I think once we sort of have a direction and know that someone's actually trodden the path before us, it sort of sometimes gives us that sense of that permission. And, and especially, I don't know, I think there's so many things to navigate at this particular point in time and knowing that it is possible and with all different sorts of age groups and demographics and spaces in time, I think is really important. So thank you. Yeah. Um, no worries. Thank you. Our next panellist is Antonia Ferrugia, the Director of Market Development at the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Antonia will discuss the strategy and thinking behind ACO's Homecast, a season of digital content released by the ACO in response to the cancellation of your national concert season. Over to you. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Frank. Uh, it's lovely to be with you all virtually. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen with you now. Let's hope this works. Okay. Is that good for everyone? Yep. As I said, it's very strange because I can't see any of you. Um, so I've just, I've got a couple of screens here, so please don't be distracted if I just look over to the side. I'm just working on that with a couple of different documents. So um, 
I'm going to take you through ACO Homecasts, which, uh, as Celia mentioned, is our season of digital content we announced on the 4th of April. Um, I'll set the scene initially. I'll just give you a brief background of the ACO, who we are, what we do, our audience and stakeholders. I'll go through some of the questions that we asked ourselves once it became clear that we could be out of the concert hall for some time. And then followed by some important considerations that really shaped the, the framework of ACO Homecasts. I'll touch you through the content itself, uh, the platforms that we're using, um, some of our ideas around distribution, and then I think we'll have some time at the end for questions. So the ACO, so we're at Chamber Orchestra of 17 full-time musicians. Our artistic director is Richard Ronietti, and he celebrates his 30th anniversary this year. So that's a whole other challenge unto itself, is how do we still make this a really special year for him? We're a national subscription-based company, so we perform in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, Canberra, Newcastle and Wollongong. And typically we embark on about eight national tours a year. So on the 15th of April, that was when we announced our, that our March tour would be cancelled. And after that point, we really had to wait until there was some synergy across the various states um, and closure periods of our venue partners before we could announce the next wave of cancellations and go out with a, a really strong a clear national message and we were able to do that on the 3rd of April so we've now cancelled all our tours taking us through to October and the day after we announced those cancellations we launched ASO Homecasts our digital season and it's important to flag as part of the the cancellation cons we were giving people three options so you know ideally we were hoping that they would donate their tickets back to the ACO back to us so not requesting a credit or a refund and then of course giving people those options as well. So then our audience and stakeholders so just quickly so we've got our ticket holders so ticket holders to the concert but other ticket holders in our database they're made up of our full season subscribers, our flexi subscribers, so anyone with a three or more concerts in their package and our single ticket buyers. We've got our online community who are very engaged international community. Uh, these are people who follow us, like us, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc. cetera. Um, we have quite a few fans in the UK, in North America, Europe. Uh, that's primarily dictated by the fact that we tour there usually every year or two. Uh, so that's great. We've got our donors who are incredibly important to us uh, at this really difficult time. We've got corporate sponsors and I'll flag that the challenge with corporate sponsors at the moment is that many of their contractual benefits are tied up around ticketing, uh, private rehearsals and performances which you know we can't deliver anymore. We've got our creative collaborators, uh, both new and existing projects, uh, the rights holders which is a challenge when you know we're working in music uh, so that could be um, music, working with music publishers, um, artists directly, uh, and also some of our film projects. We're working with rights holders there, and also media who have been very receptive and supportive of the program so far. So then these are the questions that really form the basis of our thinking around uh, ACO Homecasts. So the main one for us was, you know, how can we come out of this crisis with an even closer relationship with our audience? And can we use this period of closure to make significant strides in our digital offering? So what we're attempting to do with Homecast isn't new by any means, but the increased focus is. And for quite a long time, I'd been wanting to develop a digital content season that sat completely separate from our national concert season and was a program in its own right. But, you know, that's a real challenge when we look at, you know, access to our musicians and you know, our players are so busy, they're, they're touring, they're on a plane or in an airport lounge most of the time. So access to musicians was a challenge, um, resourcing even internally for my team and of course budgets. So, you know, a silver lining out of this for us is, you know, um, can we develop a workflow and find a rhythm with this program uh, that we would then continue beyond, you know, the, the reopening of the concert halls. Uh, what role can digital content play in providing value and securing donations? So ticket sales account for roughly 41% of our revenue, uh, followed by 37% for donor, from donors and corporates, and government funding only makes up 12% of our annual revenue. So given that we now you know, don't have any box office revenue coming in, uh, how could we use you know, Homecast or our digital offering to drive donations? 
Uh, how do we utilise digital capabilities to give people something new and bespoke? And I think Frank touched on this as well. It's, you know, we don't want to just give people a very um, mediocre or, you know, watered down version of what they would get in a concert hall. So how can we use our social channels and our, and our, our digital platforms to give people something new and bespoke that we wouldn't be able to give them under normal circumstances? And finally, you know, can we celebrate um, and amplify the ACO without our most you know, visceral and raw form of expression. So our, our core brand purpose is to inspire and challenge audiences everywhere through the music we play. And we do this by championing our four key brand values, which are united individuals, mastery, adventure and transformation. Um, so as you would expect, you know, live concerts are such an important important part of who we are and, and the purest form of this expression. So, you know, how could we essentially compensate for that? Uh, so in answer to those questions, we determined that we needed a digital offering that was as creatively robust as our national subscription season. So something which felt like that it had been curated, that had the mark of our artistic director, Richard Tonietti, um, had the same level of consideration in our artistic cloud as our subscription season. Uh, we recognise that we're playing a long game here and, and we need a strategy that can evolve uh, and be built upon over time. You know, we don't know if these closures will go beyond the six months. I mean, I think we all hope that come October we'll, we'll be kind of coming out of this and, and going back to some resemblance of normality, but that might not be the case. Uh, so we, we need something that can be built upon. Um, donations are crucial to our survival at this time, and I'm sure a lot of you are in that same situation. So how can you know, our digital season, ACO Homecast, support this? Uh, and I think also a recognition that you know, people's goodwill has a shelf life. Um, and I think the realities of life in lockdown, um, unemployment for many people, and just general financial strain will really start to take its toll. Uh, so far, I'm really happy to report that roughly 40% of our ticket holders have been donating their tickets back to us. Um, but, you know, we definitely can't take that for granted. And then, you know, community and connection is important now more than ever. So how can we facilitate this? And we're doing that by, you know, we'll talk about it when I go through our platforms and distribution ideas, but, you know, we're primarily using our social media channels because through that we can facilitate, you know, direct conversations with our audience, but also most importantly between our musicians uh, and our audience. Uh, at cut through, you know, this is a challenge at the best of times, but you know, so much more so now because many brands are pivoting to a digital only strategy. There's so much content out there. Um, so I think, you know, for us, it was really about how do we make sure that we've got content that feels distinctively ACO. Um, and we do this by working really, really closely with our artistic director, Richard, uh, with all the players, um, and, you know, we also weren't, we recognised we weren't the first off the starting blocks. You know, we were delayed in some ways, waiting for some alignment across the states in, in regards to closure, length of, um, length of closure periods. So, you know, it was really important that when we did go out, it was something that felt really considered and robust. And then we looked at, you know, who or what are our assets? So first and foremost, that's Richard and our musicians. You know, Richard has taught himself Adobe Premiere Pro um, and is now editing his own pieces. Um, we've got other musicians that are recruiting their partners to help them. Um, we've kitted all the musicians out with a um, Rode Stereo video mic uh, and also a Gorillapod to hold their phones. Uh, that wasn't that expensive. It was about maybe $200, $250 per musician. It was really important for us, you know, thinking that we could get to a point where we're in complete and utter lockdown, <clears throat> excuse me, and people won't be able to leave their homes, you know, how can we support them and make sure that they've got the tools they need to be able to continue delivering new content for us? Uh, the team, my team also produced some how-to guides so that the mus musicians, you know, felt really supported. So we sort of established a best practice and also some um, consistency aesthetically, you know, across the look and feel. And obviously at the moment we're talking prim primarily about video content. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we had to look at budget. So wherever possible, we're doing as much as we can um, in-house and, and also, you know, really delicately working with Richard and the musicians. You know, I, it's, it's really hard for them. You know, of course, they want to have the absolute, you know, highest possible quality of performance, of audio quality. And as we all know, that's not always possible in the digital space. And, and sometimes you need to compromise on that to give people that intimacy and immediacy that they're craving. So that's a a delicate juggle that we continue to play that dance. 
Uh, so the content itself, so we released, uh, and we thought it was really important that we had some kind of structure to this. Uh, so we released six serialised streams. So we've got our home to home pieces, which are intimate, solo, uh, small chamber uh, recitals from our musicians' homes, and we release those every Friday. We've got ACO Backstage, which are sort of behind the scenes, interviews, uh, Spotify playlists, in-depth written profiles. We've got ACO In Concert, which can, which is primarily uh, archived performances of full works, uh, full concerts, and we do that every second Saturday night. Uh, and as part of that, um, you know, this idea of doing something which is, you know, bespoke to the, to the digital platform, um, we have live commentary by a couple of ACO musicians. So while the concert's playing, people can be, you know, asking questions. On the weekend, we did a, um, a stream of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. We had two of our musicians you know, answering people's questions and just um, sharing their insights on the music. And that went down really, really well. Uh, from the Vault, which is archive, uh, never before released footage, uh, photography. We'll have a focus there on Richard's 30th anniversary. Uh, we've got a kids and family stream that we're working with our learning and engagement team on. That could be online lessons, podcasts, uh, material for educators, and that's something that we'll be releasing every second Monday. And then once a month, we put it out to audiences, our online community, and say, you know, what would you like us to do? Are there favourite concerts of ours from the years that you'd like us to get out of the vault for you? And we did the first one of those last Sunday. It was really, really successful. Um, fortunately, a lot of people were asking for things that we already had planned, so that was great. Uh, and then finally, um, looking at our platforms and distribution uh, channels. So, as I said before, primarily working across our social channels. Facebook and Instagram are the two big ones for us, uh, followed by YouTube, uh, Spotify. On Facebook, we're doing a mix of uh, Facebook premieres, which is uh, live streams of new pre-recorded content. Um, and we're using those for our home to home pieces and our in ACO in concert. We're also looking at uh, Facebook watch parties, which is where you can eventize previously published concerts. Because I think having that sense of immediacy and, and special event and people coming together, um, creating that sense of you know, community and that feeling that you get when you are all in the, the concert hall together is something that we really want to recreate. Um, we'd like to do more live live. Uh, we've done a couple of live Instagram stories which have been really successful. But once again, just juggling that with um, the musicians and their expectations on the, the, the quality of audio that they want to be um, going out with. Uh, once we've gone out on our socials, we upload to YouTube so people who don't have access to socials can still enjoy the content. Uh, we've set up a weekly newsletter which has um, all the content from the previous week as sort of a bit of a wrap up and what's coming up uh, for the following weeks. All of this is housed on our website and uh, we're still working out the best format for that. We're mocking up some new um, page templates uh, that will sort of house this content in a more immersive, interesting way. Um, and then we've also got our media partners and corporate partners that can help us amplify that content to a, a wider group. And then in terms of distribution, we've sort of looked at four different tiers, recognising that uh, some videos might have, uh, well, would primarily appeal to our core, core fan base, our core subscribers, whereas others, some of the more kind of quirky musician home to home videos or really um, accessible popular repertoire like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony will have a much uh, broader reach. And so those tiers uh, really dictate you know, who we're targeting, um, the campaign length, so for our tentpole releases, we'll kind of have a bigger lead up uh, and the promo budget we put behind that. Um, Celia, the last thing I just thought I'd quickly cover is monetization, because you mentioned that, so I suspect that's something that came up um, in the last one. So we've opted not to launch um, with this initially for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, our main priority at the moment is securing donations and uh, you know, requesting people to donate their tickets back to us by not requesting a credit or a refund. And we're using uh, ASO Homecast as something tangible you know, for people to feel like they're contributing to, um, as well as you know, contributing to our survival. Um, I, we just sort of did the maths and we looked at if our tickets are ranging from you know, sort of 49 to $168, we'd have to sell a lot of kind of monthly subscriptions or pay-per-views to get anywhere sort of close to that. Um, so that said, if you weren't trying to secure revenue from sold tickets, and it, it could be a more viable option for you. Um, I also had a look at, you know, average 
subscription fees for Stan or Netflix are, are pretty low, sort of looking at less than 20 bucks. So, you know, you, you'd need to have a, a really solid marketing campaign out there to, to drive subscriptions. And our focus at the moment is really on creating this content and, and getting it out. Um, I think longer term, you know, if we had a whole season of full length concerts, it's something that we would look at. But then the other consideration for us would be weighing that up against, you know, potential revenue streams from corporate sponsors. Because if we had a, a corporate sponsor who was underwriting, you know, our, our digital season, um, they'd be more interested in eyeballs and reach. And if we then start charging for the content, that would uh, drop, the, you know, the number of people that were tuning in. So, um, so just in short, I think at the moment we're prioritising accessibility and audience development and we wouldn't look to monetize this content, I think, until we, you know, exhausted all our philanthropic and um, sponsor opportunities. Thanks, Antonio. I think that actually answered John Grant's question of how the budget's doing so far, because I, I think that, you know, it is one of those things that you said you're still figuring things out and I think it's, it's so welcoming and heartwarming to hear that everyone we're all figuring things out i think um at Absolutely. the moment and i think the other thing that came through from all of that to me and i hope everyone else is that that concept of guiding principles again you had that that lovely plan that you approached this with and that um you weren't interested in just putting content up that's something that's mediocre and, and watered down as you said, the importance of that and the importance of ensuring that value continuing forward, which I think is one of the, the strongest and the most, um, it's such a challenge, I think, for everyone at the moment um, to actually address that, how we go with that. Um, so thank you. We will come back if anyone else has any other additional questions. Um, as we go along. But now we'll, we'll whip over to Megan. Um, Megan Hazlett is Communications Officer at the City of Newcastle. Before joining Council, Megan spent over a decade working at the ABC as a researcher and social media manager on shows such as Q&A, Compass and George Negus. Megan will talk about how local government has used social media to communicate their response to COVID-19 to the community. And she'll also offer some simple Facebook management tips and discuss ways to maximise engagement and the importance of content. Um, over to you, Megan. Thanks, Celia. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I guess um, I'll just um, initially um, tell people a little bit about what I've what I actually do. So I manage the social media platforms for um, City of Newcastle for the local council. Um, and um, Facebook is our primary platform. That's um, where we can engage um, with most of the community. Um, we also use Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram, but Facebook is definitely the platform that um, we find reaches the most, the most people and, and gets um, um, our message out to the most people. Um, and um, so prior to this, um, I was with um, the ABC for um, about 20 years and working in factual television production. And um, there, um, I, I also managed a lot of um, online live communities. So um, the Facebook community for Q&A, um, certainly that sort of experience um, um, now, um, last week, I helped host a webinar that um, council ran with um, some information about a program that they're um, that they're delivering, and um, certainly that came in handy. Um, but where um, the local government approach to this crisis um, began, it really began a couple of weeks before I became involved. Um, and council formed an emergency response team. And um, that team is based on a standard emergency um, response structure. It's um, headed up by the Director of People and Culture. And um, there are uh, representatives and managers from across the organisation, um, from planning, operations, logistics, finance and public information. And um, I then was brought into the team the week beginning the 23rd of March and I'm in the public information information um, team along with a couple of other members there who um, are managing media, marketing, website and internal communications and we're all working together to deliver a consistent approach where the messaging is really clear 
um, for everybody. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. Um, and so um, initially the focus was on um, announcing closures. We had a lot of um, a lot of um, facilities that were clo had to close, and there were service changes that we needed to um, uh, communicate to the community broadly. Um, and um, they seem to change um, almost every day, in line with a new public health order that um, that came out. Um, so. Um, a look and, and style was developed by the design team um, so that anybody who um, came, came across this messaging, whether it was on social media, some other digital platform, there was a dedicated website page set up and also posters and signage. Um, it was easily recognisable that this was information that we were conveying that was about COVID-19 and our response to it. Um, we also developed a social media strategy specific, particularly for COVID-19, which was applied across the organisation, including the facilities, which includes the art gallery, museum, libraries, um, Black Butt Reserve um, and Civic Theatre, and also the tourism team. And this really just outlined um, that any emergency, the emergency response team was, was responsible for, for getting those messages out just so that they were all clear and consistent across, um, across the organisation and the various facilities. Um, once we got the critical messaging out, <laughs> then we were able to um, continue to deliver messaging, but in a little bit more um, in an engaging and friendly way. And that re works really well. So, um, for example, um, the Sally the Wombat, um, we um, produced a couple of videos out at Black Butt Reserve um, with um, the animals there and just letting, um, yeah, people know that um, the animals were still being looked after, and even though that, even though it was temporarily the the um, facility was temporarily closed, um, uh, could also still people could still see the animals, and also the stay home and eat chocolate was um, really our message to follow the um, follow up on the government directive to um, stay home at Easter. <laughs> um, another thing that we've done is um, we've taken our um, school holiday programming online. So um, uh, it'll be rolling out, we'll be rolling out various um, digital offerings over those two weeks and each of the facilities really are working hard on um, coming up with different ideas. They've already come up with some fabulous ideas, um, but as they evolve and as they're, as they're delivered, then really um, it'll be my role to sort of maximise their reach and engagement um, on social media and um, um, across the corporate channels, but particularly Facebook. Um, which I guess then brings me through to, I've made some suggestions on um, how organisations can probably get the most out of Facebook. I wasn't really sure who the audience was going to be, so who I'm actually talking to. So I have that made this quite simple, like brought this back really um, simple. So, and I suppose I was thinking about sole traders or um, people who don't, or organisations who don't necessarily have extensive resources um, to hand and how they could potentially make Facebook really work for work for you during this time. Um, so if it's if I'm if it's too simplistic, I apologise. Um, but I guess firstly, I would um, suggest if you're embarking on embarking on this, is just is to make a plan to um, uh, decide what your end goal is, and then have a think about what sort of content you already have access to. 
um, that you could repurpose. Um, what new content could you could you create? What content are other people creating that your audience would find interesting that you could share? Um, and then once you've mapped that out, um, create a content plan. And and with that content plan, you know, include the time that you want the post to go out. Um, so. Um, we find that 6am is a great time for us um, and um, also even perhaps um, give each day a theme or each day that you want to post a theme. For example, Monday could be the day that you um, post a news article and um, you know that each Monday you're going to do that. It just by giving each day a little theme in some way, it makes it easier when you're trying to come up with a whole lot of content um, quickly and regularly, um, um, one after the other. Um, another thing that I'd suggest is just to get to know your audience. So dive into um, Facebook Insights and find out who is actually listening to you. Um, there's a heap of information that you can get in there. You can find out um, people's, you know, <laughs> all sorts of things, like people's ages, where they live, what they're interested in, um, but also have a look at the sort of content that you've put out that, they li that they've liked or um, really engaged heavily with, and that gives you, um, gives you some idea about what's working and what's not. Um, Optimising your content and making it mobile friendly, I think that um, this is something that people are really good at now, but I think it's also worth remembering. And particularly when um, there's, we've got to remember that there's a lot of people who still don't have access to um, computers and laptops. And if you want to reach as many people as possible um, and make it accessible to as many people as possible, it really has to be something that people can consume on their mobile. Uh, and the text is small, the, the screen is small. Um, if it's a video, um, it really should be captioned um, so that people can watch it also with the sound off. And I think to um, keeping post text short um, with that essence of the message in the first line and keeping the tone conversational, like you're talking to a friend, <laughs> they are your Facebook friends, um, that's, um, that's another tip. Um, we've also found that um, imagery, avoiding 16.9 imagery um, and using square and vertical content, it just looks more appealing. We get a greater engagement. It takes up more real estate, especially when you're consuming it on your mobile phone. Um, and we do find that video continually um, outperforms all the other content that we um, we publish. Um, Facebook Live is fantastic and I think everybody's really jumping on the bandwagon and go and um, doing more and more Facebook Live but I think a couple of things to remember there is make sure that you let people know that you're going to go live and tell them when you when you are going to go live so that they can tune in. Um, something that Antonio mentioned as well really audio is really important especially with the Facebook Live. Um, I've purchased a little uh, mic for my mobile phone. It just plugs into the headphone jack. Um, they're about 70 bucks um, and um, they're fantastic and it just makes a, a world of difference. Um, Facebook Lives need to be shot horizontally. I have made that mistake, uh, so I've learnt <laughs> from making that mistake. Um, so you've got to shoot it horizontally. And um, also after you publish your Facebook Live, it is possible to go back to, because often there's a, quite a bit of waffle at the beginning or it takes a little bit of time to get to the most interesting part. You can always go back, edit your post and say, skip to whatever time code to, um, to see the finale or to see whatever it is that you want people to, to tune in for. Um, I think remembering that communities are, uh, Facebook is a two-way conversation is really important. Um, so tagging people in places um, uh, that uh, relate to you um, is important. Um, liking, replying to audience, commenting, answering questions where you can and um, really sharing the love is, um, is, another, um, is another way of just 
growing that engagement, growing and growing your community. Um, I did put down, I was thinking about people who may not have a budget, so growing your audience without a budget. Um, one of the things is that you can, um, that you can do is really, if you've got other digital platforms, add a click through where you can. So if it's an email signature, um, an, an email newsletter or, or your website, um, just a really simple like our page to stay up to date with a great image um, will help grow grow your audience. Um, and lastly, just a couple of tips <laughs> that um, um, downloading the Facebook app on your phone um, is um, just mean just it's easy. You can just um, you can schedule content and you can reply, you can like and share um, directly from your phone. You don't don't need to turn your computer on. Um, Focusing on content is really is is really key. Um, post it post often. It doesn't matter how many times you post. If you've got content and you've got and you've got the space, it um, it, it doesn't it doesn't. You don't need to only post once a day. Um, I mentioned that before. Keeping it conversational and report regularly and reassess your approach. That's another thing. Just get back into insights once a week if you can, or really regularly because that. Um, does provide you with so much information about what's working, what isn't, and, and just, you know, change your tactic um, 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 accordingly. Um, and then I just said, be kind to yourself and um, your followers. I think we're really, um, at this time, we're all under a lot of pressure and we're all trying to do a lot. And, um, and I don't think we can all learn everything at once. Um, so I think remembering to be kind to yourself. And also people will probably ask silly questions and may come across the wrong way on Facebook sometimes, I think. Um, Humour certainly is, doesn't translate to text often. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I think just remembering that is a good, is a good thing to do. That's it. Thanks, Megan. That was wonderful. I think you made some really... Um, very, very really important points. I think definitely the last one about being kind to ourselves, the pressure that so many artists and organisations suddenly find themselves in to get their content online um, is, is extraordinary at the moment. And the volume of questions, the, the questions around, um, Jonathan, I don't know if you're still there, but I think I saw a little question pop up about how success, how success is being measured at the moment. And that that, that measure is, is, is out the door for what it sort of used to be. And I think success is anywhere from engaging in conversations and stepping into the space to contemplating the online or the digital space, or even not, even sitting back and taking a moment to actually think, is, is that space the right thing for myself and my organisation and my audience and my practice? It, it may or may not be at this particular point in time. And it also, you know, it might be that you're having, you know, lots of eyeballs or reach or engage uh, or indeed um, maintaining a, a level of engagement. And I can see Jonathan is still talking to us and that failure is okay as well. And I think, fail, you know, failure is a, is, a, is a wonderful word because I think if you don't make a mistake or if you don't fail, you never learn. And I think we all know that. But, you know, in times of, we're hearing the word crisis 25,000 times a day, even the meaning of that word now has taken on something else I would dare to say. Um, so I think that understanding that it's okay to experiment and that it is okay to keep learning and to be reminded of some extraordinary things. The fact that we are creating most things for mobile at the moment, like the stat around the consumption on mobile is extraordinary and reminding ourselves about font size. If we're actually putting fonts onto artwork or onto labels is, is extraordinary. Reminding ourselves about accessibility, reminding ourselves that our audiences, we have the opportunity to grow our audiences at the same time as maintaining our, our current followers. So I think there's, there is so much. And I, um, I, I thank, thanks, Megan. You're in our um, Facebook group already, which is something I, I actually just wanted to remind everyone that we would love to hear from anyone, you know, in the group as well, because as I was saying, it's really important to hear the, the array and the breadth and the depth of voices 
from not just the arts industry, but the supply chain in and around the arts industry, because I think you've heard a story about the volume of people in our sector, in the arts and creativity industries and, and sector. It's the volume of people that make up our industry um, that at the moment need to keep talking and find um, and be comfortable in a space to, to share um, content. So if you'd like to join um, our panel uh, next week, um, it's our email address is a new little email address that we created, like we're experimenting too and we're learning, we're, we're figuring it out as we go along. It's digital solutions at australiacouncil.gov.au. So send us a little note if there's something that you would particularly like to talk about or if there's something that you'd like to share, something you've learned very, very quickly or something you've been developing over an extraordinary um, amount of time. There's a question in the question box, which I've just hidden somewhere here. Um, a question for all from Victor Gris. So this is open to everybody on the panel. What's the impact on your digital team? And if you don't have a team or a team of one, that's you, how are you feeling the impact um, of this moment in time where the emphasis on taking your practice digitally? Well, council have um, ca council um, have really um, taken a whole real uh, people from other parts of the organisation and created a digital <laughs> and and really brought them into this um, this um, team, this COVID response team. So. Um, so they had resources at hand who um, with the expertise, but they, but really they have now, um, there's a, you know, about um, six of us who are really focused on um, that, getting that public information out from designers through to um, this marketer and website and internal comms. So it has had a, a really big impact, but it is also for work from a local government perspective, it had a huge impact on um, the resources, but we also did have the resources available and it is our main message at the moment. So I suppose it's, it's, um, it's um, just moving people who were going to be focused on something else into another area. Antonia or Frank? Um, See, can, I, can I jump back to the question about evaluation um, um, and what does success look like? Um, I, I think what's really interesting about this time is that there's more, that there's, a, there's like, Plenty of people have been doing stuff online for a long time. Like there's been digital projects and, you know, all sorts of wonderful and weird and wacky and kind of crazy things going on. But what's different about now is the audiences are there. And there's the audiences in volumes that never have been before. So it seems like a really important time to try and capture and get, you know, learn the learnings. <laughs> so it feels like there should be somebody, um, a national organisation, <laughs> not going to name any names, see ya, um, that, <laughs> could, um, that, um, that should be doing a big evaluation project on, on how the arts is basically transitioning to an online space and how audiences are, are consuming it and what works and what doesn't because the rubbish will fall away and the good stuff will rise to the top and we should know what that is. Well, I can answer that question. On, our, on the COVID side on, on the Australia Council website, you'll see that there are surveys coming up left, right and centre yeah. and right. some really, really clever, um, sophisticated thinking into the impacts of COVID on audiences and practice and, and, and other things. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. So I, I, audiences is, is my thing, and that's the thing that I, I am going to find them. I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, we have the opportunity there with a captive audience sitting out there, but it's highly competitive as well. The other thing about that is, I don't know about everyone else, but there is so much screen time at the moment that there is so much to consume. And how do we, how do you even get that time when there's so much at the moment? And how do you sift through and the fatigue? But but also the excitement at, at the discovery of something new and the curiosity that all of these experiences are, are allowing. Um, now we're getting quite a few questions through and there's a few people that are sending questions through that we might send you a little ping because you might be someone who might want to join the panel um, for a few of the questions that are coming through that we're not going to get to. Um, can we just have final comments from each of the panelists in 30 seconds or less because I am a keeper to time and we are at three o'clock. And I do want to um, to sort of wrap up and not hold hold you up any longer. But Frank, for final comments. 
my listen. I think I think we should just embrace this time with as much gusto and kind of forward thinking um, that we would if we weren't in it. Like you know, there's no reason why we can't be as crazy and wacky and wild and as wonderful as we would be in the non-digital space. Antonia, yeah, I think our focus at the moment is to look at the silver linings and see this as a really positive opportunity to expand our digital program to you know develop a closer relationship with our audiences a different relationship with our audiences and to create something that we can then continue uh, once the halls are reopened so i think trying to stay positive is a big focus for us yeah. megan yeah i think that um actually there's lots of learnings um that we will um in local government sphere take on and take um, and continue to use once this is all over. Um, something that, you know, I didn't mention, we're, we're creating, we have a, a what's on calendar and um, we're taking that to just um, um, promoting all the digital, digital offerings that are on in the local area. Um, and um, that's something that I think will continue to grow and give once this is all, this is all over. So that there's, there's some positives to take up. And, and I think it's an opportunity to... Um, to try things new, new things, yeah, yeah. And I would agree. I would say we at, at the Australia Council are doing the same thing too. We've adjusted our entire digital strategy and are continuing to evolve it. And the inclusion of something like this webinar is, is one of those things that is part of our response package, but I can foresee it becoming part of a bigger digital strategy moving forward. Coupled in that, there are a couple of other offerings from Council as well, if the audience aren't currently aware of them. Every Friday, we have a First Nations round table. The details of that are also on the website. If you know of community that don't yet know about that particular group, um, it's a very safe space for talking about all of the concerns and all of the things that need to be discussed. Um, we also have a Creative Connections webinar series, which is a longer term series at the moment with two or three webinars um, during the week, covering things like leadership and adaptation, as well as some of the other conversations around digital, because it's just too much to cover in an hour, one time a week. Um, so thank you to the panelists, Megan, Antonia, and to Frank. Thank you for the team behind the, the back making this all happen. Um, thank you to the audience for joining. We look forward to talking to you again next week. We'll put this um, online as soon as it's done its thing, its packaging up thingy. And um, we'll look forward to, I know it's highly technical. Um, we look forward to talking um, with everyone next week with a topic that you will um, no doubt share with us what you would like us to talk to you about. So, cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.